Today's lecture will be our first lecture in our acid-base chemistry unit. It is an introductory lecture to our acid-base chemistry. To start our acid-base unit, we first must define acids and bases according to the three most common definitions available in chemistry. The first definition, Arrhenius. Arrhenius is a Swedish chemist uh, in 1887 who published a paper defining acids as solutions that generate hydrogen ions and bases solutions that generate hydroxide ions. Examples here, first example of an acid generating hydrogen ion, you have hydrochloric acid. It is a strong acid as we will discuss shortly in our lecture. This strong acid produces hydrogen ions and chloride ions in solution when it hydro, hydrogen chloride gas, for example, is dissolved in water. Now we show the hydrogen ion here. We need to define that the hydrogen ion is also more commonly referred to as the hydronium ion. Another way you could write this reaction would be to have hydrochloric acid react with water to form H3O positive and Cl negative. For our purposes in class, we are going to refer to the hydronium ion and the hydro hydrogen ion uh, as synonyms or synonymous with one another. The idea here is that there is an attractive force between the hydrogen and the chloride over here, and there is also an attractive force between the oxygen, the electronegative part of the oxygen, and this hydrogen ion right here. So the water ends up having a greater attractive force on this hydrogen ion than the chloride itself. And therefore, you see a transfer of that hydrogen ion from the hydrogen chloride gas to the water molecule. The base example, when solid sodium hydroxide is placed into water, it will ionize 100% into sodium ions and hydroxide ions. Once again, this idea that in a solution, you generate these hydroxide ions and therefore uh, it satisfied the definition of an Arrhenius base. The next definition that we have, in 1923, two scientists, Lowry and Bronsted, proposed that any substance that donates a proton is an acid and any substance that accepts a proton is a base. The idea is that this hydrogen ion is also just simply a proton. We remember from uh, earlier in the year that hydrogen has one proton and one electron. So if we're dealing with a hydrogen positive one ion, we have removed the one electron and simply just have one proton. The example of this would be a weak acid such as HiO3 reacting with water when that occurs. Again, you have that attractive force of the water molecule, the, electron, the, the delta negative, the electronegative end of the water molecule, the oxygen, is a, a, has an attractive force over this proton at the start of this acid formula, the HiO3. So what we see is, as a result, we form the hydronium ion, and then we are left with the iodate ion as a result. Now, to define them as an acid and a base, we have to look at the reactants versus the products in this chemical reaction. From the reactant side to the product side, the HiO3 is donating a hydrogen ion. We have the hydrogen ion located right here, and then the absence of the hydrogen ion right here. Therefore, we would define the HiO3 as our acid. Again, it is donating the hydrogen ion or the proton in the chemical reaction. The water in this example is going to behave as the base. It is accepting the hydrogen ion and going from H2O to H3O positive there. The third definition, also in 1923, a gentleman by the name of Lewis, and that name should ring a bell from first semester chemistry with a Lewis dot structures. Lewis was focused on electron pairs and how electrons are moving within a chemical reaction. Our example here is going to be NH3 reacting with H2O. 
that happens in equilibrium and we produce NH4 positive and OH negative. I think it's best understood when you look at the Lewis definition to actually look at the Lewis dot structures of these two molecules. So if we have NH3 and H2O, Again, H2O is a polar molecule. You have a delta negative end and a delta positive end of the H2O molecule. What happens as a result, again, is this uh, analogy of a tug of war. You have one of these hydrogen ions okay, that ultimately they have an attractive force to the oxygen of the water molecule and in close proximity an attraction to the lone pair of the ammonia molecule located right here. As a result of that, what happens is that lone pair becomes what's called a coordinate covalent bond shown like so there on the ammonia molecule. Because we've added a proton, now this has an overall positive charge. This pair of electrons right here becomes a lone pair of electrons around your oxygen like so, and therefore this ends up with a negative one charge. As we look at these Lewis dot structures, we can see that the NH3 is donating the pair of electrons, this pair of electrons right here, drawn by the blue arrow, donating the pair of electrons to form that coordinate covalent bond. Therefore, we would define the NH3 molecule as a base in this example. The water would be defined as the acid because the proton or the hydrogen ion that is part of the water molecule is accepting the electron pair again to form this coordinate covalent bond in the NH4, the ammonium ion. Moving on, some general characteristics of acids and bases that we need to be aware of. Acids, we'll start off with sour taste. Obviously, we do not want you tasting acids in class, but there are some household acids that you have consumed whether you realize that they were an acid or not. The classic example of this is citric acid. Okay contained in all your citrus fruits, your limes, your oranges, etc. The list goes on and on there. Another example of a household acid that you consume is vinegar. Vinegar is acetic acid. The next characteristic that we have to talk about with acids are litmus paper. We have red litmus paper and blue litmus paper available to us in a chemistry lab. Acids will turn blue litmus paper red. The third characteristic, pH. Most of you have had some experience with the pH scale. We'll do a quick review over the pH scale. pH scale, the most common pH scale used in class has a ends of 0 and 14. You end up with 7 in the middle. 7 is considered neutral. And you find generally your acids located below 7 on the pH scale. The next characteristic, corrosive. Corrosive mean they react with many, many different materials. Acids are uh, very reactive substances, and we will use caution when dealing with them in lab here in the upcoming labs we have for this unit. Next characteristic, strong electrolytes. Remember from our solubility unit that we just completed that uh, strong electrolytes are substances that produce mobile charges in solution. Your acids produce lots of mobile charges in solution, which help you to conduct the flow of electricity through that solution. Now, we have the second part of that says strong acids, ionize 100%, and the list below. One of the few things you need to commit to memory in your chemistry course this year is the list of strong acids. You will handle the 
uh, ha handle the various problems that we have this unit in different ways based on whether or not you have what is called a strong acid or a weak acid. So the strong acids are listed right there. You have HCl, H2SO4, HNO3, HClO4, HClO3, HI, and HBr. Please commit that list to memory. A strong acid will ionize 100%. So, again, you have hydrochloric acid reacting with water to produce the hydronium ion and the chloride ion. Notice I drew a one-directional arrow in my chemical reaction there, and that is because this reaction is 100% products as a result of that chemical reaction occurring. There are no reactants left. Versus, say, a weak acid, an example of a weak acid, would be your acetic acid that we just talked about. The weak acid example, we have CH3CO2H. That will establish an equilibrium, and you'll have an H positive and CH3CO2 negative. By establishing an equilibrium, that means this reaction does not go to completion. When we achieve equilibrium, you're going to have a certain percentage of your reactants and a certain percentage of your products in your reaction vessel. Generally speaking, most of your weak acids ionize 5% or less. And that's a very big generalization. We'll get into more specifics once we get to our weak acid and base lecture. But you end up with only about 5% or less of your material on the product side versus the strong acid example that we just did, which is 100% ionization. Moving on, our base characteristics that we have listed down here. Bases have a bitter taste associated with them. Again, I don't want you tasting bases in lab, but there are some uh, uh, some household chemicals that you even wouldn't want to taste, but chemicals that you would at least be familiar with. One example would be Windex. A lot of your cleaning agents that you do not want to consume in your household are basic solutions. The, uh, the common bacteria that we try and eliminate in our homes uh, thrive in this acidic environment, but do not handle basic environments very well at all. Therefore, a lot of our cleaning solutions are basic environments in an effort to eliminate that bacteria. Bases have a tendency to feel slippery within your fingers. Again, don't want you touching bases, but uh, that is a very unique characteristic only to bases. Litmus paper. You now have red litmus paper turning blue in the presence of a base. Oftentimes, I remember that the Bs match up. Turn litmus paper blue for bases, and that's how I often remember which type of litmus paper is the appropriate type to use for bases. We talked about the pH scale earlier with the acids. Okay, we said the acids were below 7 on the pH scale. Your bases are found above 7 on the pH scale. And we will talk more in depth about the pH scale in one of our later lectures. Bases are also corrosive. They react with many, many different substances. We will use good, we use good laboratory technique when handling these in our labs. Bases also are strong electrolytes. Just as we discussed with the acids, you have strong bases ionizing 100%, and you have your list below here. All of your alkali metals, sodium, potassium, lithium, rubidium, and cesium, when they combine together with hydroxide, then you have barium, calcium, and strontium that then combine together with a hydroxide to form a strong base. Please remember with these last three that you're going to end up with something other than a one-to-one -one ratio. So, for example, barium hydroxide. When it is placed into water, you're going to form barium ions. And for every one barium hydroxide that dissolves, you are going to produce two hydroxide ions in solution. Now that we have definitions of acids and base and some basic characteristics, when we mix an acid and a base together, we get a particular type of double replacement reaction called an acid-base neutralization reaction. 
generally speaking, you have an acid reacting with a base to produce H2O, a salt, and I'm going to put the salt in quotes, and energy. Okay. We haven't talked about thermochemistry yet, but reactions that produce more energy by forming the products than are consumed to break the reactant bonds are called exothermic reactions. And we discussed this a little bit in our equilibrium unit, and we'll talk about it uh, uh, in depth in our next unit, thermochemistry. Now, the reason salt is put into quotation marks here, what we're really talking about is some type of ionic compound that is formed as a result of the acid and base reacting together. Our first example, we have hydrochloric acid reacting with sodium hydroxide. These are both strong acids and, uh, excuse me, a strong acid and a strong base. We know these are going to ionize 100% when combined together with water. So what we really have in our solution are hydrogen ions, chloride ions, sodium ions, and hydroxide ions. Because we are dealing with a double replacement reaction, we know that the two outer species will combine together and the two inner species will combine together. Now, the outer two, the hydrogen ion and hydroxide, are the first product of any neutralization reaction. By definition, a neutralization reaction is going to produce some water as a result of combining the acid and the base together. The other reaction is the ionic compound that's formed as a result of your chemical reaction. In this example, it happens to be table salt, sodium chloride. And we remember from our solubility unit that sodium chloride will be aqueous. It will continue to be dissolved in water. Now, we can take the chemical reaction like we have listed here, and we can do a calculation with it. Combine our stoichiometry with our newly found knowledge of acid-base chemistry. The question posed for the end of our lecture here today is, what volume of 0 0.150 molar HNO3 solution is needed to react with 20 milliliters of 0 0.200 molar NaOH solution? If you have not gotten out your mole map, at this point, that will be really helpful for you. The first step of solving any problem like this is for us to write a balanced chemical equation, to practice what we just learned in the previous portion of our lecture. HNO3, that's from the list that we just learned about. That is a strong acid. Then we have NaOH, that's also from one of the lists we just learned. That is defined as a strong base. We know both of these are going to ionize 100%. So we will produce hydrogen ions, nitrate ions, sodium ions, and hydroxide ions in our solution. Because it's a double replacement reaction, we know the outers are going to combine together and the inners are going to combine together. The outers give us what we always expect out of any neutralization reaction that combines together to form water. The inner ones, we have sodium ions and nitrate ions, which we know are aqueous. Both examples I've shown in this lecture, we have not had to balance the chemical equations. The one-to-one -one ratios have given us a balanced chemical equation. But please take a moment once you get to this step to make sure your equation is balanced. Now, our starting point. We have two concentrations and one volume. If we remember from our solubility unit, concentration molar is units of moles per liter. Because that unit has two units within it that makes it to be a really good conversion factor. So we're going to start with the volume of base shown in the problem, 20 milliliters of NaNO3. We're starting at the bottom of our mole map, and we are ultimately trying to solve for some volume of HNO3. I chose liters. When the problem's not specific, you could choose liters or milliliters. So we're at the bottom of the mole map. The bottom of the mole map says volume of a solution measured in liters. First thing I've got to do is I've got to do a unit conversion. 1,000 milliliters in one liter. That gets me on to the mole map. Now I'm going to move from the bottom of the mole map into the center. To do so, I am going to go ahead and multiply by the concentration given to me for the sodium hydroxide, 0 
moles per liter of NaOH. Now that gets me to the center of the mole map. I'm ready to now go ahead and use a molar ratio. We can see from the problem that we have, the balance, excuse me, the balance chemical equation we have above, that for every one sodium hydroxide, we require one HNO3. So that's going to be my molar ratio. One mole of NaOH for every one mole of HNO3. I'm in the correct species at this point. I have the nitric acid, and now I just need to get the proper units. I'm looking for liters of nitric acid instead of moles of nitric acid. So I'm going to move from the center of the mole map back down to the bottom. To do so, I'm going to divide by the concentration given, 0 0.150 moles per liter of HNO3. Unit-wise, we get milliliters to cancel, liters to cancel, moles of NaOH to cancel, moles of HNO3 to cancel. So the only unit we're left with is liters of HNO3, which is the unit that we are trying to achieve here. We get a final answer with three significant figures of 0 0.0267 liters.